I lost my dad in 1972 over the jungles of Southeast Asia. I was only three years old. Two years ago, I went to find him by riding my bike on the same trail that he'd been sent to bomb. So imagine finding your way home after being lost your whole life. I've built a career out of not being lost. <laughs> the sports that I do, climbing, adventure racing, whitewater rafting, they're the kind of sports that where root choice, strategy, smarts often override the physical prowess. Planning how to get from point A to point B as fast and efficiently as possible. As a professional athlete, that's what I'm really good at. In life, <laughs> I admit, not so much. I've been lost more than most people. After college, I had a good job, a roof over my head, and I decided to leave it all behind. The outdoors, the road was calling. So I loaded up my Bronco, steered into the unknown, and a lot of people would have thought that was a really bad navigational choice. To try to survive with no insurance, no job, no idea where I'd be sleeping next week. But for me, the alternative, sitting in an office, looking out the window, and wondering what was out there, that was not an option. And the hardest part wasn't making ends meet. The hardest part was answering the questions. Where do you live? <laughs> what do you do? Where are you going? I didn't know the answer, so I wandered like this for 10 years. And methodically, I built a career as a professional athlete. 2003 was the year that all the uncertainty and the sacrifice paid off. Our team won the World Championships. Sports Illustrated named our team as one of the top adventure racing teams of the year. Outside Magazine called me out as one of the top female adventure athletes. So now, <laughs> when you have to put on that line, what's your occupation? What do you do? I actually had something to write down. Finally, I was a professional athlete. But the most important thing that happened in that year was that for the first time in my adult life, I found a place I could call home. This tiny mountain town of Ketchum, Idaho, it grabbed me and I couldn't explain it, but I stopped wandering for a second and it laid down some roots. And a mortgage, <laughs> way more terrifying than class five rapids or any big wall <laughs> that I've ever climbed. But once I started nesting, unpacking the boxes, unpacking my truck, I knew I was in the right place. I have never measured success based on money, but instead on security. And it felt so good to be grounded, to be stable, secure for the first time in my life. I was now able to answer two of those hard questions. Where do you live? I live in Idaho. What do you do? I'm a professional athlete. It was pretty cool. And just one year later, the whole thing crumbled. Sponsorship dried up, my desire dried up, after witnessing the death of a friend during an adventure race, I lost my purpose and my identity. Suddenly, racing seemed selfish, it seemed pointless. So again, I was lost, and the questions came back. What do you do? What are you gonna do? I avoided them. I curled into a ball, I crawled into my house, and I hid out for a while. And the easy option would have been to quit, stop, go get a real job but I didn't know how to change direction yet. So I did the only thing I know how. Different sport, same path. Because going long, being in the pain cave, that was a familiar place for me. That's all I knew how to do. So I worked harder, and for 12 years, more world championships, more accolades, more awards. It was working again. I'd met my measure of success one more time. And I could answer those questions again. Where do you live? Still Idaho. What do you do? This time, I'm a professional cyclist. <laughs> but a totally new question came up. 20 years as a pro athlete is a really long time. And so people started asking me, why? <laughs> why are you torturing yourself? Why are you going back again? What else do you need to win? What else do you have to prove? The question made me squirm. I wanted to run. I was forced to look inside instead of outside, backward instead of forward. 
totally the opposite of what I trained for my whole life. This is dad. <laughs> Part of me went missing a long time ago. I don't remember my dad. I was too little when he was shot down. But my mom saved his letters, his journals, his photos, his music, and she kept them. We didn't talk about them. I never asked. But now I needed to find myself, so I went looking for him. He was a navigator and a four phantom plane, one of the primary fighter jets in the Vietnam War. But to me, he's a musician, an animal lover, a father. And like me, <laughs> he lived out of his truck for a while. He was an adventurer. He also lived in a time of war, and he did his duty to serve. And on March 7th, 1972, he was on a flight mission over the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos. He was two months from finishing his tour, but he never came home. I didn't know much about the Ho Chi Minh Trail, except that that's where my dad was last seen, and that it was the main artery for supplies and soldiers during the Vietnam War. I got my first taste of what jungle survival might be like at a brutal adventure race in Vietnam in 2003. Our team, we weren't being chased, we weren't being shot at, but we were being chased, and we were struggling to survive. Infected bug bites, trench foot, insane heat, difficult navigation, and immersing myself in the jungle that time, it was the first time I felt connected to my dad. I almost felt like I was in his shoes. And I went a little deeper into exploration. I went to the DMZ, the border between North and South Vietnam during the war. I went and explored the tunnels, the underground tunnels where Vietnamese people lived to hide out during the war. I went to Da Nang Air Force Base, where my dad was stationed and the last place that he was seen alive. I went to the Hanoi Hilton the place where American soldiers, American prisoners of war, were held and tortured, and I hoped he was never there. I stood on the grounds of the bloody battle of Quezon. It's now a coffee plantation, and it's beautiful. Our Vietnamese guide, he pointed west, and he said, look over there. That's the Ho Chi Minh Trail right there. Can you see it? And I could see it. And I took this picture, and I knew that I had to come back someday. It took me 13 years, but I got back there. This time for the biggest ride of my life. But this time, no other competitors, no trophies. My physical goal was to be the first person to ride the entire length of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. It's 1,200 miles of complicated network. It runs from Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh City, or Saigon goes through Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. The other goal, my personal goal, was to connect with him in the only way I knew how, by spending time in the landscape where he disappeared. And this trip it was not about closure. It was about opening, a homecoming, finding my true north. And reopening that scar, that wound, for my mom, my sister, and me, it was like re-breaking a bone so that it could finally heal right. It hurt, but it was essential for our recovery. And what was guiding me that whole time were some simple map coordinates, the coordinates of my dad's crash site. On the trail, I uncovered more than I ever could have imagined, and it became so much bigger than me. This place is a living history with scars, waste, destruction that are still evident. Laos, where most of the trail is located, has the unfortunate notoriety of being the most bombed country per capita in history. During the war, the Americans dropped the equivalent of a plane load of bombs 
every eight minutes for 24 hours a day for nine years. Now, our waste is repurposed and reused. Bomb casings become garden planters. Scrap metal from planes like my dad's become fishing boats. The bomb craters, they fill with water and fish, and they sustain life. And this trip was about life, not death. Among the scars, the healing, the forgiveness was so evident. When we'd ride through the towns, the kids would yell, Sabadi, hello, and they were so happy to see us. They'd invite us into their homes, share what little they had with us. They also have the reputation for being some of the friendliest people on earth. I got to sit with one village woman and talk with her. She lived through the war. She told me the story about how she'd lived in a cave for six years while she waited for the bombs to stop raining down. Both her children were born in the cave. When she came out, her village was gone. There was nothing left. The landscape there is still pockmarked with bombs and unexploded ordnance. The craters are evident everywhere. And when I asked her, why did you come back here when everything was gone? And her simple answer, it was my home. Where else would I go? This trail and these people, they are helping me find my sense of home, my belonging. And I found an amazing history, but I also found a missing part of myself. And going there and connecting with all of these people, it was getting, like getting my very own F4 navigator, just like my dad to sit behind me and gently guide me in the right direction. And this new direction, it's helping me develop stronger relationships with my family. My mom is now sharing about her past. My sister is letting me know her life choices and why she stayed in the military. She's now a colonel in the Air Force, and part of her job is to support the families and soldiers who come back from war. In the last letter that my dad wrote from the war, he said, if something should happen to me, please don't let me die to Sharon and Becky. Well, he's not dead. I'm getting to know him through them, and now getting to know them through him, and it's a magical gift. I had to stand on the ground in Laos to feel the air, to hear the jungle, to look up through the trees and see the sun shining down, to physically feel close to him, and to truly find what it means to be home, to find my direction, my compass. And now I know I've been navigating through life alone. That's what was wrong. I had a personal agenda, looking out for number one, and it wasn't working. I kept getting lost. I needed dad, a navigator, to show me. The only way to fill the void that was missing in me was to open myself up to other people. And whatever I was searching for, it was never going to be found in my own sweat or among my own piles of trophies. It could only be found through other people. So now those questions. <laughs> what do you do for a living? Where are you going? They don't bother me anymore. It doesn't matter. Because now all that matters is that I connect I follow my internal compass, and then the trail will always lead home. Imagine again, finding your way home after being lost for so long. It's possible for all of us and easy to throw out the map you've been holding and trust your internal compass to guide you. And when you feel at home in your heart, that's when you're truly at home here, wherever you may be standing. My dad has some instructions for us in a song that he sang, a simple message he sang to me and I want to share with you. And if you listen to the lyrics, he tells us to go wander, connect, and take comfort in the fact that knowing we're all a little bit lost, but if we're lost together, it's okay. And then, when you do return, to hold on as tightly as you can to the people 
and the places who give you a sense of security and belonging because that's what we all need. Take it away, Dad. It's a long and dusty road and a hot and heavy load. Folks I meet ain't always kind. Some are bad, some are good, some have done the best they could. Some have tried to ease my trouble in mind. And I can't help but wonder where I'm bound, where I'm bound. Can't help but wonder where I'm bound. I've been all around this land just to doing the best I can Trying to find out what I was meant to do And the faces that I see, they're as worried as can be And it looks like they're wondering too And I can't help but okay wonder where I'm words. bound, where I'm bound Can't help but the wonder words are easy. where I'm bound You see me passing by and you sit and you wonder why You wish that you were a rambler too Nail your shoes to the kitchen floor Lace them up and bar the door Thank your stars for the roof that's over you And I can't help but wonder where I'm bound, where I'm bound Can't help but wonder where I'm bound Once again And I can't help but wonder where I'm bound, where I'm bound can't help but wonder where